and give the Lord more of me this year. I'm still too selfish, Brother Kyle. I still think too much of myself and my time, and I hold on to my my ways and too much. It's a convicting song. God wants me, He wants more of me this year in 2019. He wants more of you this year. Will you give me more of you this year? Amen. All right, let's go to our Bibles this morning in Psalm 27. Say, preacher, it's my life. I'll do what I want with it. <clears throat> Everything we have is a gift from God. Every breath you take is a gift. I'll deserve nothing. I deserve anything. I'll deserve all the many zillions of blessings of God. Think how much He's blessed you. Think about it. Well, I know you're blessed trillions of ways because you're made up of trillions of cells. And you can even break it down even further than that. Each cell is uh, how many particles are in a cell or make up a cell those proteins and all that DNA and all that stuff. I mean, you get down to it. That's not exaggeration. I say zillions of blessings. That is not exaggeration. Oh, Pastor. Oh, oh yeah. God's amazing. And give us life and health and to save us an opportunity to serve Him and live for Him here. And it's not just here. Uh, we're going to continue to be with Him and serve Him for all eternity. God's got all kinds of stuff planned for us. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be wonderful. Amen. We're going to be living with the angels one day in the presence of God, around all the saints of God. Everything's going to be holy. Everything's going to be wonderful. There's going to be no devil, no wickedness, no temptation, no evil. It's going to be awesome. Amen. And there might even be some holy chocolate. You never can tell. You just never can. Psalm 27. Read it with me if you would. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though a war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion, in the secret of His tabernacle shall He hide me, He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me, Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yet will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I see. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Lead me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for our false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I have fainted unless I have believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And may the Lord add His blessings to the reading of His Word this morning. And there's so much good stuff here in this wonderful psalm. Um, I thought what a precious verse that is in verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Sometimes, you know, family uh, can turn against us. I met this guy at my dad's church. He got saved. 
And I tell you, those French Canadians, man, they can be fireballs for the Lord. And this one fellow got saved. You know, the French, they're, they're spirited people anyway, you know. And then when they get saved, you mix that with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they burn the, the town down, you know, you know, as far as their zeal. Um, well, this guy got saved and uh, from a Catholic family. And uh, his parents got real mad at him. His father uh, was a fairly rich man uh, in the, neighbor, in the, the uh, community, and they had a, uh, a school, a hair styling school, and I actually worked for him for a number of years, uh, cleaning the school for them. And uh, he got so mad at his son for giving his heart to Christ and becoming a Baptist, I guess. I guess he thought it was some kind of a cult, you know. Um, that he came over to his house one day, and outside of... Uh, the house they had these you know the big concrete pots you know the really big you know for the big plants you know or shrubs and uh, both him and his son both were bodybuilders and so he had no problem he lifted the whole thing up and he threw it into the windshield of, of uh, his son's car and the interesting thing about that was that he had given that car to his son and uh, and they just were so angry with him and uh, turned against him his wife ended up leaving him. Uh, she wasn't saved, and she said, "You got to choose either me or, or Jesus." And he chose Jesus, and um, yeah, boy. Uh, sometimes your family will forsake you. You know, friends will forsake you. But I thought, what a precious verse that is, verse ten. Then the Lord will take me up. Yeah. Amen. The Lord will be there with you along the way, even though it gets rough, it gets hard sometimes. I'm telling you, if you remain faithful to God, give it some time, but eventually, God will vindicate you. God will show your family that what you have is real. And maybe down the road, because of your faithfulness in walking with God, they'll come to you and say, you know, I don't have what you have. I need the Lord. Will you show me? I see God in your life. I see him helping you. I see your happy home. I see how you're being blessed. And uh, I'm miserable. I need Jesus. Sweet, please help me. <laughs> and it's at that moment, that time, you'll be so glad that you stayed faithful to God. And did you not live for a family, did not live for him you know, to please man, but you lived for God and did what was right. Yes, you still love him, you still care about him, and you show love to them. Yes, you don't turn them off. You don't uh, mistreat them. But... Uh, we have to follow the Lord. Amen. And please Him. And God will bless you. You'll see it down the road. I know you will. The passage, uh, a verse in particular I'd like to look at here in Psalm 27 is verse number 4, where David says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. We've got to work at this. Amen. I think we spoke of that on Wednesday night. Uh, the spiritual life is work. It's, it requires diligence. God expects it out of us. Uh, if you want to get uh, anywhere far in this world, you got to work at it, all right? The same thing goes spiritually. We got to work at this. We got to seek after this, all right? Bible says here, or David says, "That will I seek after," uh, and that is that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. It almost sounds like David saying, "I want to be in church all the time." Now, wouldn't that be great? We could just stay in church all the time. I think that's the way heaven will be one day. We should be in church all the time. <laughs> Having a great old time worshiping God and serving the Lord and just it's gonna be awesome. Imagine we have church all the time. Now to a lost person, that's like what? Right. <laughs> you know? That'd be like death to them, you know. I tithe my hour to God. I'm good for the week, you know. Now I like church. I could be here with you guys all day. You know, I, I love it. It's great. But I know we gotta go home, we gotta eat, we gotta do different things. But being with people of God, it's, it's great and that's wonderful. But this dwelling in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, I believe me, I'm church with God anywhere. It meant you can worship God all the time. Now, some people carry that too far. They go, I don't need to go to church. I need to go to a physical church then because well, I've got the Spirit of God with me. I, I can worship God anywhere. Yes, you can, but it's important to be with God's people too. Okay? Because you need the encouragement. They need to encourage you. And we're in this together. And the local church is 
important. Okay, we do see that in Apostle Paul, and the, the apostles made that very clear in the New Testament. There needs to be a local church, there needs to be a pastor, there needs to be an overseer. Uh, we need help along the way. And uh, be able to encourage each other in the Lord, provoke one another to love and to good works, the right of Hebrews says, right? So not forsaking the assemble ourselves together, um, that's very important. But this dwell in the house of the Lord, yes, this can happen all the time. Amen? Uh, David wanted to be in that dwelling place with God, uh, that special place of uh, worship with the Lord. He uh, mentions two things here. He says, number one, to behold the beauty of the Lord. I believe the Lord becomes more beautiful the closer we get to Him. And the less beautiful the things the world become. They, they lose their glimmer the closer you get to Jesus. He becomes brighter and brighter and everything else becomes dimmer and dimmer. That's the way it should be. Amen? To behold the beauty of the Lord. Um, are you beholding the beauty of the Lord? He's so beautiful. He's so wonderful. There's no one more, more wonderful than Jesus. You need to get closer to Jesus. Amen? And behold the beauty of the Lord. And David says also, number two, I want to inquire in His temple. I want to seek the Lord diligently. I want to have His guidance in my life. We see in, in the Word of God, the Bible speaks of the uh, the two parents that we have. Uh, number one, we're born of the Spirit. Our, our spiritual parent, number one, would be the Holy Spirit of God. John chapter 3, verse number 6. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And then our other parent would be the Word of God. Peter talks about that, right? First Peter chapter 1. Uh, born again, not of uh, corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the Word of God. Those are your two spiritual parents you look to. The Spirit of God and the Word of God. Uh, there are things that the Spirit of God will teach you and guide you in that aren't necessarily written in the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Certain convictions He'll give you. I don't think anywhere in the Bible it says you cannot smoke marijuana. I don't think you'll find that in the Bible. But if you follow the Spirit of God, I don't believe you'll smoke marijuana. Do you know what, you know what I'm saying? The Spirit of God will guide you into all truth. And He helps us. Amen? And He leads us as we uh, will be led by Him. Today, if you would, go to Genesis now uh, for the message. Genesis uh, chapter number 12. We've been reading... Uh, you've been reading with us uh, the Bible reading so far this year uh, in the book of Genesis and uh, what a blessing that's been. And I've been thinking of uh, another message, but I uh, just was pondering over um, Abraham's life and how God uh, called him uh, out of his country. God called us out of our country as lost people, as sinners. We were in the land of destruction. Have you ever read uh, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan? John Bunyan was an old preacher, Baptist preacher in England, back in the 1600s. Went through a lot of persecution. Back in the day, if you did not receive sanction or a license uh, to preach, you could be imprisoned. Uh, I've been ordained as a minister, but I don't necessarily have a license to preach you know, from the government. I've been just ordained by... Uh, Baptist Church has sent me out. But there's been times in history where governments are you know, very controlling of uh, churches and pastors and so forth, what they teach or what they preach. And John Bunyan said, I'm going to preach what the Bible says. And he would not go along with the status quo and to you know, be a part of the mainstream religion. Okay, And so he was persecuted for that. And he was put in prison. And they all, oh, man, it's so sad. And he was in there for quite some time. But while he was there, God gave him this wonderful book to write. And it's called The Pilgrim's Progress. It speaks of the child of God. And it's a spiritual allegory of how you're taking a trip. And you're walking you know, uh, along a path and uh, the narrow way. And you're, you're going to the celestial kingdom. You're, you're, you know, um, and along the way, you meet all kinds of different things. And you go through all kinds of different trials and tribulations and temptations. Right? It's a wonderful book. I, I encourage you to read it. But, um, yeah, uh, Abraham left his country 
Uh, we see that in verse number one. God said, get thee out of thy country. And when God saved you, you got out. Amen? You got out of uh, where you were and where you came from. Uh, you were lost. You were a sinner. Uh, that's our background. That's our heritage. But thank God we got out. Uh, in verse number four, uh, Abraham departed. I'm so glad I departed from the old life. I'm so glad I departed from the old man. Um, that's not my life. That's not who I am anymore. I know I still deal with this flesh, and I'm still in this body. I was so glad to be rid of this body one day and be in my glorified body, and no more uh, temptation, no more tempter, and um, with the Lord, it's going to be so wonderful. Um, but uh, God's been good, amen? And He's still good, and um, He helps us along the way. And you, as a child of God, you've departed. Uh, thank the Lord. You've followed Him. That's what we see Abram doing here, verse number 4. He continues on his way, and God leads him to this place. I'd like to uh, bring to your attention in uh, verse number 8. It says, He removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel. God wants to bring you to uh, a higher place than, than where you started. Amen. God wants to uh, help you to continue to go up. Um, we mentioned uh, last week about pressing toward the mark and how it is a, it's an incline. It's, it's, it's a slow, gradual incline. God wants to bring you closer to Him on a mountain, so to speak, spiritually. And so you get closer and closer to God. We find here it was a mountain on the east of Bethel. Now, Bethel in the Bible means the, the house of God or the house of the Lord. This place of uh, closeness with God. This place of worship. Uh, this place, I believe, that David was speaking of. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Anytime, everywhere, all the time. And it says, And Abram pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and um, Hai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord. Again, I stress it's going to take some work. Abraham was willing to put some work into it. To build an altar. It took some time. It took some effort. Are we taking the time to build an altar unto the Lord? I believe reading through your Bible, that's, that's part of it. You know, uh, making a schedule, uh, making time to work at it and seek after God. And then it says, and he called upon the name of the Lord. Now, uh, it would be nice if uh, we could skip the next few verses and go on to chapter 13. But God puts here in the Bible... Uh, things here as a warning for us. Okay. Uh, can you imagine, me and Ms. E were just talking about this morning, imagine if, if your life was in the Bible. All your mess-ups, all your mistakes, it's written in the Scriptures. You know, we can't tell the future, can we? But, in a way, you can. If you compare yourself to the Scriptures, and you see the errors that they made, and if you see your life kind of head in that direction, you say, oh, why better not go that way? And because uh, I know if I do, I'm going to end up like they did. You know, I'm going to make the same error, end up with the same, you know, problems and, and troubles in my life, right? So if you use the Word of God the way God means for it, you understand it, that is to apply it to yourself. It's not just a storybook, okay? It's not just something you read, oh, that's what happened. Okay, big deal. No, you apply it to yourself spiritually. And you learn from the errors and mistakes are made. It's not, you know, make fun of them or, man, what do they mess up for? What's wrong with them? You know, no, it's, man, I, mean, I, I don't want to make that same mistake. And I believe if Abraham was here today, he would say the same. It says in verse number nine, and Abram, his name wasn't Abraham yet, uh, Abram journeyed going on uh, still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land. Uh, don't be discouraged, Christian, because of of the, the famine that's around us. Uh, Satan wants you to be disheartened. He wants you to be discouraged because of the famine in the land. Okay, Where we live, it's uh, it's an evil place. You know, It's a wicked place. And, and you get your eyes on what's going on around us, you can be disheartened. You can be discouraged because of the famine in the land. And we can uh, be tempted to give in to our flesh. And go back down into Egypt. Notice Abram went down, and Egypt's always the type of the world in the Bible. And you go back to the world, you're going down. 
You're not going up to God, up with God. You're not going up the spiritual incline up the mountain of Bethel with God. You're going down. God wants to uh, elevate our view, right? Get our minds more on Christ and God and truth and the Bible and living for the Lord. But if we turn towards the world, we'll go down. And he went to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And we see that uh, it didn't go well there for Abraham. He almost lost his wife. That would have been bad. Eh? And uh, thankfully, uh, everything worked out in the end. But uh, still, it was a trying time. And, and sometimes, you know, we can go through troubles when we don't have to. You know? Um, God means for us to, to walk in the victory. And not that we're never going to have any problems at all, but we can have a, a victory about us where we can stay on that incline all the time with God. And we can have that Bethel time with the Lord all the time. Right? Don't make concessions to go back down to, to Egypt. Now we do see in verse number 1 of chapter number 13 that Abraham came out of Egypt. Sometimes we've got to get right with God. Got to realize, God, I'm going the wrong way. I'm going back towards the world. I'm going back towards those things that don't really truly satisfy. God, you're the only thing that satisfies. God, I'm coming back to you. I'm going to get my heart right. And what a blessing. Abraham got right with God. And you can too. I can too. I'm thankful for that. And he and his wife and all that he had and locked with him into the south. Uh, you know, if you look back at verse number 10, when uh, Abraham went down into Egypt, he took family with him. There's a lesson in that as well. If you choose to quit on God or turn back on God and go back towards the world and looking for the things the world to satisfy you now that you're saved, which cannot happen. It's impossible. Um, the only thing can, can thrill your soul from now on is Jesus because you're saved. You're, you're changed now. Um, maybe you could find some thrill or satisfaction in the world before, but, but not anymore. Um, not to... To the degree, uh, right? But Abram took family with him. He took Lot with him. Uh, that was a bad influence. He was being a bad influence, wasn't he? And we affect others when we choose to turn away from the Lord. And we're not being faithful to God and not want to get closer to God in that Bethel in our life, that house of the Lord. Abram comes out, verse number one of uh, chapter thirteen. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And Abram called on the name of the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. I just like to emphasize uh, calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, and how important our prayer life is. I don't think enough can be said about prayer. And I'll be honest with you this morning, I don't pray enough. I need to pray more. I want to pray more in 2019. How many would agree with me? I want to pray more this year than I've been praying. I just... I read my Bible. Pretty good at that. You know, I got that down now. Pretty good, you know. And, keeping that schedule, but it just seems like my prayer life is not where it needs to be. Not, not as long and in depth and you know fervent and as it needs to be. That's an area where I need to grow in. I admit that to you this morning. Number one, let me say concerning Bethel by House of the Lord, we need to, we need to go back to Bethel. Let's go back to Bethel. Let's call on the name of the Lord. Let's have a closer walk with God this year. Uh, it's time to get serious about our prayer life. It's time to get serious. Uh, that would be number one this morning. It's time to get serious. The devil doesn't want you to get serious. He wants you to stay at a, a distance. He wants you to... Um, just be uh, melancholy, you know, about your spiritual walk. Uh, uh, you're doing enough, you know. The flesh will tell. Oh, you're doing. You went to church today. Oh, you're you're good for the week. You're good. Oh, you went to church, right? You sang the hymns. 
for a whole hour, you listen to that long-winded preacher, and oh, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. Right? And we pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, I guess I am. I'm not doing too bad. I'm doing as good as anybody else. Right? And we give ourselves huge breaks. You know, we shouldn't do that. Don't do that this year, okay? Be a little harder on yourself. Okay? It's okay to do that. That's a good thing. Let's get back to Bella. Let's get serious about our prayer life. Our Lord said to the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, this was near the end, and they knew everything the Lord was going through and what had happened with Judas and all that. And, uh, you know, things were kind of winding down here and what the Lord had been saying that I guess was going to be coming to pass. And I know some of them didn't like it. Peter didn't like it, you know. But uh, they're with the Lord there in the garden of Gethsemane. And the Lord had been praying there for a good while, about an hour or so. And remember the Lord came back to them and they were sleeping. Is that not what we're doing spiritually? Sleeping on God. Taking a nap. Taking a nap on God. Don't want to push myself too much. Don't want to be too hard on myself. Way too easy on ourselves, aren't we? Way too easy. Here's the Lord, he's about ready to be crucified. And his disciples are taking a nap. But we can be just as bad with our spiritual naps. I've been taking way too many spiritual naps. I said, you stop, stop taking so many spiritual naps. The Lord comes to him in the garden and says, What could you not watch me one hour? One hour? Could you not spend with me? Pray with me? And this time I'm going through for you and the world. Well, we can spend an hour watching a movie. An hour and a half, two hours. Goes by just like that. You can't spend an hour with God. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? God help us to get back to Bethlehem. Let's go back to that. Let's, it's, it's time to get serious. The Lord goes on to say to the disciples there in the garden, He says, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He said, preacher, why do I keep entering into temptation? Why am I having this problem in my life over and over? Could it be that we're not praying enough? Did not the Lord say, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation? May we just need to be more serious about our prayer life. And we'll find that God will help us. We notice back here in Genesis that Abraham, because he went back to Bethel, God blessed him. God worked in his heart, worked in his life. He had a sweet spirit about him. Don't you want to have a sweet spirit this year so that you can be a blessing to those around you and God give you wisdom when you encounter different things and trouble comes along. We're all going to have troubles no matter what. But it's, it's when you're in tune with the Lord, when you're walking with God, that He can help you through those times and give you such wonderful wisdom. Uh, the Lord blessed uh, Abraham in dealing with Lot here. Uh, you read on down and uh, Lot's... Uh, herdmen were having strife with uh, Abraham's uh, herdmen. And Abraham says in verse number 8, uh, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. God's not for strife. I'm not for strife in our church. It's when there comes to a point where there's strife in the church. Either the person gets right and follows me, and follows God, or they have to go. That's right. No strife. No strife here. No drama llamas in the Bible Baptist. <laughs> we, we don't do drama here. Either we're in agreement, or we're not. Or we may have to separate. There is times for separation. Abraham had to separate from Lot, his nephew. Paul separated from Barnabas. There is time for separation. We see that in the Bible. Now, Abraham didn't stop loving Lot. 
And I haven't stopped loving those that have had to depart from our church. I still love them. In fact, Abraham put his life at risk, if you see in the next chapter. And he went after Lot and saved him. Didn't he? Well, that proves right there he still loved him. So just because there has to be separation doesn't mean that the love has to stop and the caring has to stop. But the Lord was trying Lot's heart at the same time. Lot chose the wrong way. Lot chose the plain, uh, close to Sodom and Gomorrah, the well-watered plain. Looked good for his cattle. But he was headed towards Sodom, looking towards Sodom and Gomorrah, that wicked cities. Bad move. What if Abraham had not gone back to Bethel? Maybe he just said, you know, with Lot, I want the plane. You know, let's split the plane. You know, or something like that. And Abraham could end it out of, out of God's will. But Abraham chose to stay in the high country. Right? The Bethel, Mount, with God. Good decision. Good choice. Right? And sometimes God's way... Uh, I would say probably most of the time is the more difficult path. <clears throat> but it's the most rewarding path. You just stay with God. He'll look after your cattle. He'll look after all your stuff and this life. And, you know, you just follow God. He'll look after you. You'll be all right. But do what's right. Do what the Spirit of God's telling you to do. Not what always maybe seems in a fleshly way to do or what might be the best thing. Follow the Lord. Abraham had a sweet spirit. And uh, just was so gracious to Lot. Hey, you choose. Whatever you want to do, you, you choose, you know. Lot makes the wrong decision. And because of Abraham's walk with God and you know, staying close to the Lord, God blessed him and used him to deliver Lot in chapter 14. And God will use us, amen, to be a blessing to many if we'll get back to God, if we'll get serious about our prayer life. Don't you want to be used in a greater way this year? I want to see God using me more this year. I want to lead someone to Christ. Yeah. That's exciting. That's the most exciting thing in the world. It would be exciting to parachute from 40,000 feet or whatever they do, 30,000, 20,000. That would be exciting. It would be exciting maybe to win a million dollars. Now, I don't go to the lot, I don't gamble, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> to have that much money at the same time. Maybe a better illustration would be someone gives it to you in your inheritance. Um, you think of all the exciting things in the world. But more than that, to win a soul to Christ, to lead someone to Christ, oh, it's the best. You know? You should never lose sight of that. Living for Jesus, walking with Him, and Him using us, and living through us. But it only happens if we get serious. Let's get back to Bethel. Now, if you would now go to 1 Kings. Let's, let's keep Bethel in mind. We haven't uh, left that thought. But we're going to leave Abraham in uh, Genesis. We're going to go over to 1 Kings now, to chapter number 12. We're going to see where Bethel shows up again. Here during the reign of uh, King Jeroboam. King Jeroboam was the first king of the divided kingdom. Remember Solomon son of David, the great king. And then after that, there was uh, a division in the kingdom and Solomon's son, Rehoboam, reigned over Judah, the tribe of Judah. And the rest of the house of Israel, all the other tribes, uh, the other, uh, uh, they followed Jeroboam. Jeroboam here is the first king. He was not a good king. And we see in verse number 25, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25, then Jeroboam built Shechem in the Mount of uh, Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel and Jeroboam said in his heart now shall the kingdom return to the house of David he didn't want that to happen and so he says in verse 27 this was his scheme if this people go up to sacrifice in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem which was still uh, the capital of the kingdom and it was located uh, in Judah under uh, Rehoboam the other, other side uh, the other king he said, Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel 
um, bad counsel. Right. Make sure you're choosing good counsel. There is bad counsel. Um, he said, or the counselor said, uh, make two calves of gold and uh, said to them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem because uh, our whole thy gods, O Israel, uh, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, blasphemy. Right? So here King Jeroboam sets up idols here. And he sets them up in Bethel. Notice that. The place of worship. The place where Abraham had made his altar. And he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship for the one even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people which were not the sons of Levi. And that was again, that was against God's commandment. Only the sons of Levi. The tribe of Levi could serve uh, the Lord as far as the temple duties. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered him on the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even the month which he had devised of his own heart, his own wicked heart. And ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burned incense. You see, Pastor, that's that's terrible. That's that's wicked. I can't uh, see how Jeroboam would have done that to take such a holy place that everybody knew that that's where Abraham had gone and built an altar to the Lord and to set up idols. But I say unto you that we can set up idols in our heart, and we can profane this temple. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And we could profane that by idols in our life. Let me just mention a few of those idols. Number one, the idol of self-will. The idol of self-will. Disregard for authority. Do you disregard the authorities in your life? If you have disregard for the authority in your life, it's just proving um, this is how you look at God. How you treat the authority in your life is how you treat God. That's right. Yeah. So, Pastor, I don't agree with that. I'll tell you, it's, it's true. Okay. The idol of self-will, the attitude of nobody's going to tell me what to do. Everything's a suggestion. You know? The way you treat authority in your life is how you treat God. Keep that in mind. The idol of self-will, it can happen. We can set it up in our heart and profane the temple of God. Also, another idol, the idol of self-pleasing. Not willing to deny ourselves, indulging ourselves too much. Whatever I want, I give to myself. That's a bad rule to live by. Just do it, right? Nike says. No. That's bad advice. The eyes of man, God's word says, are never satisfied. Our flesh is a monster, it's like a black hole. You start giving into that thing, it won't quit. It just gets hungrier. The idol self, it's, it's a good thing to say no to this flesh. No. No, no, no. We have to say that to kids. Yeah. No. That's probably one of the first words they, they learn besides maybe mama or dad. dad. No. Don't touch. Right? Touch right. pop. Don't touch. The idol is self-pleasing. We can set that on our heart. And it profanes the temple of the Holy Ghost. Number three, the idol being self-centered. Does not think of others. Oh, that's not my problem. Oh, really? When all we think about is our interest and our troubles and our life, our four and no more. We're in a sad state. Very sad. God puts you here to serve Him, Christian, child of God. The reason why you're here is to serve the Lord, to serve others. Is that not what Christ's ministry is all about? He had no relays head. He was always out serving others, living for others. He many times he was tired, but he kept going and loved people. Took time for them. 
let's realize this life is not about us. It's about living for the Lord. I'm not saying you can't enjoy life and God doesn't give us some time to enjoy ourselves. He does, but this is not the focus. It's me and my life and my family. It's to live for others, right? To treat everyone like Jesus. What a thought, eh? To treat everybody like Jesus. Yeah. Even the people you don't like or, you know, is that what the Bible says in the Gospels? It's high time to get sacred. Amen. And stop defiling and stop defaming, profaning the temple of God. Number one, let's go back to Bethel. Number two, let's don't profane Bethel. It's time to get sacred with God. Sacred with the things of God. This temple, it's a sacred thing. Let's treat it like what it is. The temple of God. If you could go back to Solomon's temple, you know, can you imagine going to that holy place, right? That was designed by God. Basically, the blueprint is laid out in the tabernacle and there being filthy wicked things in there idols and, you know, just profane evil things right? you'd be like get this stuff out of here what was it doing in here you know we'd be upset we'd be mad this is god's house this is god's temple how about my own heart are there some profane things there that I need to deal with? Why are we so easy on ourselves? May God help us to be real with God and get sacred with Him and not profane Bethel as Jeroboam did. We can look at these examples in Scripture, these stories, these real life examples, and think, oh man, that was awful, but I can do the same thing. You and I can do the same thing. Again, it goes back to the two spiritual parents, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Listen to the guidance of the Spirit of God. He'll lead you and guide you to all truth. The Spirit of God is convicting you about something. You need to listen. And He's telling you you need to get rid of that idol. You've been too self-willed, disregarding authority. You've been too self-pleasing. You're not denying yourself like you know you should. You've been too self-centered, not thinking of others like you should. It's time to get sacred. Get rid of those idols. Now let's go to one other uh, passage here of Scripture concerning Bethel. 2 Kings chapter 17. Let's move down the road just a little bit to 2 Kings now. And verse, I'm sorry, chapter 17. One last thing I'd like to bring your attention about Bethel. Not only go back to Bethel, let's get serious about the things of God, our prayer life especially. Call upon the Lord as Abraham did. Number two, don't profane Bethel. Let's get sacred. It's time to get sacred. Concern the things of God. Being sacred about the temple, the Holy Ghost, which we are. But number three, look here in 2 Kings now, chapter number 17. Now, God's judgment by now was falling upon Israel, the uh, northern uh, ten tribes. Uh, God used the Assyrians to bring that judgment upon Israel. Later on, Judah uh, would be judged uh, by Babylon. But here we find the Assyrians have come. And uh, what they've done is they've uh, displaced uh, the people uh, from the area there in the northern kingdom. And they brought their own people, heathen people, into the land of Israel to live in their towns and their places. It was a sad time. Very sad. Well, what had happened was... Uh, once these heathens uh, came in, they were living there in the land of uh, Israel. We see in verse number 25 that God sent lions among them and slew some of them. And uh, they, they realized that this was judgment from the God of Israel. And uh, so they complained back and they said, hey, we, uh, we don't know this, this God. <laughs> of course, he's the only God. Of course, they had their own false gods and so forth and uh, worshiping devils and things like that. But... Um, 
not real gods, right? He's like, our God's only real God. And so they sent back and said, hey, we, we don't know how to live here in this land and how to deal with this, this God, the true God. And so uh, the king of Assyria says, hey, let's get one of the priests that we took out of the land. Let's get him to go back and teach our people, or those people there, uh, how to you know, deal with, with this God, how to live. Uh, they were pleasing. And so in verse number 28, it says, Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. If we will dwell with God in Bethel, and that's the last one today, dwell in Bethel. If we'll dwell with God in our Bethel, God will settle us, He'll teach us, He'll help us, He'll mature us, so that we can teach others how they should fear the Lord. Sometimes we should be further along than we are. We, we should have been settled by now. or We should have learned certain things by now. God needs to settle you, Christian, and mature you spiritually so we can be a help to others. Maybe sometimes we feel like we're not ready or we're not able to uh, minister to others. Let's get the help that we need. Okay? And um, I'm just putting myself out there. If I can be a help to you this year, if you'd like to do some uh, discipleship classes or uh, let's have some Bible studies. Again, I know in the past we've done some Bible studies with some of you. Okay? I know some of you ladies with Miss Eva. Um, let's do this. Okay? Let's, let's continue that. Uh, that's where we get good counsel. Right? We're both we're looking at the Word of God together and we're growing together and being helped each other. It's not just, oh, come to church and the rest of the week, ah, I don't care, you know, uh, it's your life, do it, do your thing. But let's, let's stay more connected if possible, okay? I'm not saying I, I, I want to get too much into your private life and all that, but uh, I think we can be a little more connected and it's, it's a good thing, right? And certainly if you want to grow and you want to mature and, and you've got some time and, and you want to put that into the Lord and uh, it's a very good thing. I think it's part of dwelling in Bethel. And it's that settling that God wants to do in each one of us. God needs to settle you, ground you, right? Grow you. Paul says, I'm, I'm sorry, Peter says, uh, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish strength, and settle you. Uh, notice it's going to take a while. It doesn't just happen just like that. It, this spiritual growth, this maturity in the Lord, we're all growing and it takes some time. It takes some work. It takes some diligence. But God says, I want to make you perfect. I want to establish you. I want to strengthen you. And I want to settle you. This is what God wants to do in our life. There'll be lots of trials and tribulations, temptations, lots of studying and learning and praying and mentoring and counseling and all these different things. And it's important for our spiritual growth. Okay? So, apply yourself. Read through the Bible. Amen? Uh, set some time aside with the Lord each day. Uh, be willing to put more time into it. Uh, plan it out. Be willing to deny yourself. Sometimes um, maybe of, of rest or, or different things, right? Or God just says you need to get earlier, or, you know, before you go to work or something like that, right? Oh, I don't want to get up early, you know. You, you fight back and forth with yourself. It's good to deny ourselves, okay? Or make a time at night before you go to bed or however you want to do, work your schedule, but make sure that you're, you're growing and you're applying yourself unto the Lord to get settled and get grounded and mature in the Lord. And so that we can be used of God to teach others. And there should come a time where some of you men should come up here and preach a message or share a thought or a devotion or something like that. They're called lay preachers. Laymen that are preachers in the church or, you know, willing to... Uh, Take some responsibility with the pastor, back up the pastor, and uh, be a blessing to the congregation. You know, you ladies, and uh, helping each other, being encouraged for each other, and strengthening and helping other ladies, maybe young ladies, or uh, 
the young in the Lord that come into the church, right? Kind of come alongside them and make a blessing to them. It shouldn't be always the pastor and his wife or whatever just, just serving the church. Uh, as we grow in the Lord, we, we serve each other and we reach out and we do more and more, right? We, we expand. God blesses our ministry that way. Uh, if you're not careful, you can say, oh, that's, that's the pastor's job. That's Miss Eva's job. You know? Well, I guess in a way, but uh, I wouldn't say it's a job, though. It's a calling. It's, it's a ministry, right, that we're in. And we're in this together. So see our church as a church where you get involved. God wants you to get involved here. It's not just come to the service, warm the seat, warm the pew, and, you know, that's it. And you're good for the week. And you just kind of forget about Bible Baptist Church until the next Sunday or whatever. And we want to be involved and working and growing together as much as possible. And I know some of you live at a distance. You're not living too close to us. And I know it's hard for you sometimes to be involved. But maybe down the road, amen, God can help us to be more, more connected. Uh, let's be looking towards that and asking God to help us, amen. Uh, I'm looking forward to a good year. I want to go back to Bethel. I want to be more serious about the things of God, especially my prayer life this year. I don't want to profane Bethel. I want to be more sacred. It's time to get more sacred. For us to get more sacred. And I want to dwell in Bethel. I want to get settled. I want to, I want to continue to grow this year. I, I know God's working in me. is showing me some things I need to change. And uh, You pray for me, and I'll pray for you. That we'll continue to grow and be more and more settled in the things of God over time. Amen? Bethel, the house of the Lord. David said, I want to dwell there all the days of my life. I want to stay close to God. I don't want to go back down to Egypt. I want to stay on the mountain with the Lord. I want to continually be inclining with God on the mount. Not going down into the plain like Lot. Going down to Egypt or going towards the world to Sodom and Gomorrah. God help us, I mean, we got Abraham that was greatly used of God. Had a sweet spirit. Didn't get mad at Lot, you know, about the strife that was going on. They separated and uh, they just continued, you know, uh, on. And Abraham chose the right road. God used him and blessed him and you know, was able to rescue Lot and his family. God wants to use you to rescue souls. Look for God to do that this year. Expect more out of yourself this year than last year. Let's continue to grow with God. Set some goals. I know we talk about resolutions and that sort of thing, but as long as they're spiritual resolutions, I don't think it's a bad thing. You know, uh, spiritual goals and try to stay to that, stay to a schedule. These are all good things. Amen. As we stay in our Bethel with God.